Welcome to this edition of the Homestead Colloquium. Uh, the colloquium is organized by two centers at Homestead University, Kaiser and Ceres. The, both centers are funded by the KK Foundation and the series is focused on topics broadly related to cyber physical systems and embedded and intelligent systems. It's a great, great pleasure today to introduce Professor Warwick Tucker, Professor of Mathematics at Uppsala University. Uh, before he was Professor at Mathematics, he made uh, stops at several great places, including being the H.C. Wang Professor at Cornell University, and before that, uh, a postdoc at IMPA in Brazil. And before that, he did his PhD at uh, Uppsala University on the existence of the Lorentz attractor. And many of us probably that are interested in differential equations or dynamic systems have looked at the Lorentz attractor. And many of us, like me, have assumed that, well, obviously it's a strange attractor. Uh, apparently, this was folklore for a very long time, but nobody had proved it. And Warwick, in his PhD thesis, managed to prove that the Lorentz attractor is indeed a strange attractor and that it exists. Uh, to give you an idea of the significance of this achievement, it was first recognized in Sweden by the Wallenberg Award from the Swedish Mathematics Society. Then soon after that, it was recognized by the Moore Prize for uh, the use applications of interval uh, methods. And uh, somewhat more recently, a little bit after that, by the European Math Society uh, by a prize for recognizing distinguished contributions to mathematics. So it's a real pleasure to have uh, Warwick Tucker here today. And uh, he will be telling us about some of the methods that he actually used to achieve this feat. Uh, the applications are far beyond this particular proof, but we're really pleased to have Warwick to tell us here about these methods today. So, welcome. Thank you very much, and, and thank you very much for inviting me to Halmstad. It's my first visit to this city, and it's a really nice pleasure to be here and to speak to this audience. So what I want to talk to you uh, today about is how to combine mathematics and scientific computation. And that merge I call validated numerics. It's how to use a computer to help you prove things in mathematics. And then I don't mean problems like the four-color theorem, which is discrete. I mean how to prove problems in analysis that, use, that are based on continuum of the real line. So this is a different kind of type of computer-aided proofs. Okay. So first, as a mathematician, you get a little bit scared on your first encounter with a computation. Because you think that computers, well, it sounds like they compute, they're good at computing. But when you try it out, um, you see that this is not necessarily the case. So if we take a kind of repeated addition, so what I mean by these, these angled brackets is I'm telling the computer 1 over 1,000. So I'm thinking I'm telling it 1 over 1,000. Of course, 1 over 1,000 is not exactly representable in base 2, so it will round that. And then I ask it to add that number to itself a 1,000 times. That should sum up to 1, right, in my mathematical mind. Of course, on the computer, it sums up to something else. Close to 1, but not 1. Something slightly smaller than 1. If I take 1 over 10,000 and ask it to sum it with itself 10,000 times, it does a similar mistake, this time in the other direction, it overestimates the result. And again, because it, A, it cannot represent this number exactly, and B, it cannot perform addition exactly. Right? So, the order of summation is another thing. Addition, I mean, it really depends on what order you sum things. So here's the first million terms in the harmonic series. I don't know why you would like to add them, but let's just do that. So, one, half, a third, quarter, down to one over a million. And you get some answer here, 14.357. If you reverse the summation, so you start with the smallest term, and then add upwards, you get something else. And 
as a mathematician, then knowing nothing about computers, you would ask yourself, I mean, which one of these is correct? I mean, none, of course. <laughs> I know now. But which one is most correct? Uh, yeah. Start with the small ones. But the, I mean, so com scientific computing is based on these types of operations, and mathematics is not. And if you're trying to prove something with rigor, this is kind of not a good start. So you have to deal with this somehow. It gets even worse, of course, if you're trying to do something slightly more uh, sophisticated, but nothing advanced at all. Here's a function of two variables. It's almost a polynomial, actually, uh, except that I have a division at the end there. And let's uh, plug in some values into this function and evaluate it. Because how do you convince yourself that a, a numerical computation is correct? where you can rerun it in higher precision. <coughs> so you increase the precision of your computations until it stabilizes. Then you're pretty sure that it's correct. So if you happen to have a really old computer, an IBM <laughs> 370, the, the, yeah, these were, the, <laughs> these were very popular at some time. This uses base 16, actually, internally, not base 2. It doesn't matter. And, uh, and if you program this function in Fortran, then you have these types that are called real 4, real time 8, real time. And this is about the, the number of mantissa digits you have. So it's a precision that you're computing with. So think of it as number of decimals, but in base 2, basically. Uh, and you would plug these numbers in. And here there's no problem. These are exactly representable, as are the coefficients here. So this function is exactly representable on your machine, uh, and so is the input. So it's only when it's performing the operations that any mistake can happen here. And here you see, okay, 1.1726, and you get more digits and more digits. Here we'd be pretty convinced that the answer is correct, because you increase the precision and it kind of looks good. If you do this on a also ancient but Pentium 3 processor, this is old examples I did, using the GCC compiler, uh, then you have float double and long double instead, but it's the same principle. You're increasing the accuracy of your computation. You get this huge integer result. Right? So these are complete, I mean, at least one of these has, has to be wrong, right, by a big amount. And here you would be pretty convinced in both cases you would trust your results because you're computing with very high precision and, and the results are not changing. The real answer is minus 0 0.82739, so it doesn't even get the sign right. Right? And the reason why this happens is that you have this tremendous cancellation happening. You have some two huge integers that you're subtracting, or two, two very big floating point numbers that you're subtracting, and then the little bit that gets left behind is invisible. But the errors are, are kind of happening at different places here for these different systems. And now imagine what you want to do with scientific computing today. You want to simulate a huge system maybe atmospheric dynamics or some metabolic pathway, lots of differential equations, nonlinearities, and maybe you want to do this over a long period of time. So you're performing these type of operations en masse, I mean trillions of them. So how are you going to rely on the output from that simulation if you want to claim something mathematical? Well. So the problems that happen here are, are with rounding errors, and we'll talk about other errors later on. But how can you control a rounding error? We can't even add two numbers and get the exact result. Well, one way, which is very nice um, on, on the modern architectures, is that you can tell it how it should make the mistake. You can tell it if it should kind of make the mistake on the plus side or on the minus side. So is your answer going to be an overestimation or an underestimation? And you do that by changing rounding modes, it's called. So this means round up to positive infinity, and this means round down to negative infinity. If you take any of the four arithmetic operators on, your, on a computer, and you ask it to perform that on two floating points, so this will denote floating point numbers, then the mathematical result of performing the same operation is guaranteed to be within this interval where the lower endpoint is a rounded down answer and the upper endpoint is a rounded up answer. 
this is valid for one operation, but you want to do trillions. Right? So, and this will give you, not only will it give you this enclosure, this will be of maximum quality. That means that these two points are going to be adjacent floating points, or the same, if you could actually do, perform the operation exactly. So this is what it's going to look like. Here is a mathematically exact result, but it's not representable in your machine because you only have a finite number of floating points, but it will give you the smallest interval containing that real number. Okay. So that's what I call by maximum quality. And the methods I'm going to describe do not require maximum quality. It's just extra nice to have it. But, and we have that for the arithmetic operators, but not for other functions like the exponential and so forth. You cannot guarantee maximal accuracy, but you can still guarantee enclosure, which is good enough. Okay. But then the question comes, okay, so this happens after one operation, we get an interval as a result. So if we're going to do anything further on, our inputs have to be intervals as well. So we might as well just forget about floating point numbers and just do arithmetic on intervals and see what happens. So how do we compute with intervals? And then I'll, and why? Well, I've shown you one, one reason to do that is to control rounding errors. But it actually turns out there's a much better reason than that. But I'll come to that later. Okay. So, so now we'll define this space. We'll forget about the computers for a while and go back to being mathematicians. So we'll look at the real line, but the intervals of real line. So we're looking at compact intervals, so unbounded, no, bounded, sorry, bounded <laughs> and closed intervals. Okay. Then it's very easy to define arithmetic operators. Right? You just do it in the set valuedness because an interval is a set. So if you want to take an interval times another interval, you just take every element from the first interval, every element from the other interval, perform the operation on it, and that gives you your set. Okay. Except that, of course, you're not allowed to divide by zero. In fact, you are allowed to divide by zero if you're careful, which is very useful, actually. So there's a way to extend division to allow for division by zero when you're computing with sets. It's very natural and, and has real applications, actually. But today, we'll not do that. We'll not divide by zero. Okay. Okay, so this is a perfect uh, definition for a mathematician, but it's a lousy definition for someone who wants to implement this because it has uncountably many cases to consider, right? We're, we're going over the continuum. We're taking A from uncountably many <laughs> values here in this interval. But uh, fortunately, since we're only working with the arithmetic, uh, these operations are, are basically monotone, so it's enough to check the endpoints. Okay? So I'll denote the lower endpoint of the interval A by underscore and the upper endpoint by overscore. Right? So of course, when you're adding two intervals, the smallest number you can get is by adding the smallest members, right? And the biggest by adding the biggest. The reverse for subtraction, multiplication, well, there you have to check some different conditions. So here you have to multiply four things and then take the minimum and maximum. In fact, you can get away from this if you check the signs of the endpoints. Um, th then you can make this more efficient. Um, strangely enough, on the modern GPU architectures, the graphic processing units, they hate conditionals, so you don't want if statements, so it's actually quicker to just compute everything and then take the smallest and the largest. Okay, and then division by taking the reciprocal of B and then just multiplying A with that. Again, that you can optimize for speed if you're interested, but we're still in the mathematical uh, part here, but going back to the computer, I just told you that you can't trust the computer to perform addition or subtraction or multiplication or anything, so you have to do the outward, this directed rounding again. So for instance, for addition, we would compute this lower endpoint with the rounding mode pointing down, so we underestimate the result, and the upper endpoint with the rounding mode pointing up, so we overestimate the endpoint, and similarly for, for the other operators. So this is called directed rounding or outward rounding. So this gives you not 
I should write the definition here because the true result is going to be included in this. So it's not going to be equality always, but I'll always have inclusion, and that's all I need. Okay. Now we want to do the same for functions. So we've done this for the four arithmetic operators. So by just composition, you can get this for any rational function then. You can get uh, an interval extension of a rational function. But you want this for general functions, like trigonometric functions and so forth. So what we want is, <coughs> given some basic function or complicated function, f, real valued, we want to find its interval valued counterpart. Right? And that counterpart, its interval extension, should satisfy this. That if you plug in an interval to that, it should give you an interval back that contains the true range of your real valued function over the same domain. So all possible function values you can take. Now, ideally, you would have equality here. That would be perfect, but that's impossible. That's just as hard as global optimization, right? Finding the biggest value of a function over a domain is as hard as you make your function, right? But it turns out that if we loosen that and just require inclusion, we can do this efficiently. Right? Now, sometimes you might get a very bad inclusion. For instance, this could be minus infinity to plus infinity almost, right? And that wouldn't be so good, right? It says that you're if you're trying to predict the temperature tomorrow, and it says, oh, it's between plus minus infinity. It's correct, but it's not so useful, right? So the name of the game is to try to make this as close to this as possible. Right? And there are various ways of doing this, of course. Okay, so this is the kind of the graphic way we're doing. We're leaving our, our calculus world with point-valued functions and trying to go to a set-valued world where the input is a set and the output is a set that contains the, the range of the function. So you might notice here that these lines are not completely horizontal, so this is going a bit upwards and this should go a bit downwards, just, just to kind of illustrate that I'm overestimating the range a bit. Okay. And this is completely doable and has been done, and there are libraries that do this for you. So it's, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. What kind of things can you use as a mathematician with this kind of information? Because now I can have a computer that does this kind of calculation. I give it that interval, and it gives me that interval back. So now maybe I can prove something using this type of computation. Well, if we kind of reverse or look at this relation here, it means that if I have a point outside my interval image, if I have a point here, for instance, so outside the blue uh, range enclosure, that means that my real valued function could not attain that value over the domain x. Right? So it's kind of a disprover. Right? I can say that something is not here. And that's perfect, for instance, if you're trying to solve a system or uh, nonlinear equations, for instance. They want to find zeros, but a good step towards finding zeros of a function is to throw away parts where there are no zeros. So if you put y equals zero, this will give you an exclusion principle while you're searching for zeros of your nonlinear function. Okay? But I'll, I'll just give you some basic uh, elementary functions, standard functions that you could write. Now, all of these, I realize, this is back, well, all of these are monotone and <laughs> increasing, so of course they just have to check their endpoints. In the mathematical world, when you're actually trying to implement this, it's harder, because you can't really trust your computer to give you a good number here. Right? Because the exponential, how does it compute that? Well, it goes to a software library, it does a million of operations, no, it does not a million, but many operations, lookup tables, argument reduction, blah, 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 and then it comes out with something. So you can't trust the built-in functions. You have to write your own ones that you really believe in. But there are ways of doing this, and it has been done. And you have to think about rounding and so forth. But mathematically, this is what you do. For other functions, well, you just split the domain. This is not a monotone function, the sign, but it's periodic, and you can split it into pieces where it is monotone, and then just glue it together again. So here you have four different cases, 
depending on if your input interval straddles one of the maxima or minima of sine or not. So that's, that's one way. So, I mean, f functionally, it's very easy to implement this. And when it comes down to the actual implementation bit, you have to do a little bit of work. But you c it has been done. So, so, you have this library of interval valued functions now. What can you do with that? Well, now comes the real reason for computing with intervals. One was to keep track of the rounding errors, which is important if you want to prove something or, or detect kind of small errors. The other one is adapting your discretization level of a global problem. So say you want to illustrate the graph of a function, nonlinear function. So what you do is you just convert this to its interval valued partner. So you have the interval cosine and the interval sine and the interval cube. And then you plug in your whole domain. So here's a domain minus 5 to 5 that I've split first into eight pieces. It gives you these turquoise results. So for this piece, I'm getting this interval back as a range enclosure. And what I can say is that at every level of discretization, the boxes that I'm getting back are guaranteed to contain the graph of the real valued function. Because right? I'm enclosing the range of that function. And you see, as uh, my discretization gets finer and finer, I'm actually approaching what looks like a, a normal point value graph of a, of a function. Right? There's actually a collection of, of many, many small rectangles here. So th this is looking at it from above when I just project everything. So you see this black line here is a guaranteed enclosure of the function graph. And this you can prove, this you can use to do a lot of things in analysis. Quadrature, for instance. You can think of, if you just use the lower bounds for your function, and multiply them with the width of the boxes, that will give you like a lower Riemann sum. If you take the upper bounds, you're overestimating the function, that will give you an upper Riemann sum. And as the discretization gets finer and finer, these two approach each other. Actually, the error you're getting in, in using the lower bounds as a lower bound for your integrand and the upper bounds for the upper bound is the area of these boxes. You see that the area clearly tends to zero as my partition gets finer and finer. So I'm going to get an interval enclosure of the, the integral of my function doing this, which is guaranteed. Right? And that means that I can partition where these partial sums of my integral seem to have problems. Right? So some regions maybe I don't have to split so much, some regions I have to split, I can let my program take care of that because it will see how wide these boxes are and it will know that it has to split more the wider the boxes are. And I can stop when I, I give it some threshold, some tolerance. I want four decimals accuracy. And then it will stop exactly then. It won't compute forever. It will stop when it has four decimal accuracy because it knows exactly the upper and lower bounds. It has an enclosure. And the same for finding zeros here. Obviously, or optimization, if I'm trying to find the minimum of this function, I can obviously throw away this turquoise box, that one, and that one, because the lower bounds there are larger than the upper bound in this box, for instance. So there's no way a global minimum can reside in any of these three boxes. So that's another way to kind of discard portions of your search space. Okay. And I like this example. It's old, so look, solving nonlinear equations. Again, say that we have some coarse interval enclosure of our function, which is a red graph here, and we're trying to find zeros for this. Right? Then, of course, these light blue boxes can be thrown away. They obviously cannot contain any zero to the function. The green ones can. They may not, but they, they can. Right? So those we can keep, and we subdivide them, and then we throw away more boxes and subdivide. And at the end, 
we'll get a collection of boxes whose union is guaranteed to contain all zeros of our function. And this is, I like this because this is an old algorithm from, from the Bible. So consider everything, that means plug in the whole domain, keep what is good, the green ones, and then you avoid evil, throw away the blue ones. So this is well known. And this is interval valued by section, right? So, and the great thing about this is no solutions can be missed. If you take your calculus or numerical analysis 101 book with point valued by section, it will just find one zero for you, if you're lucky, right? If you have many, and it might not find any, because it has, the starting conditions is that your function value has opposite signs on the endpoints, and it might not, right? So th this will never throw away uh, a solution, okay? Now the modern interpretation of that Bible quote in MATLAB looks like this, okay? So it's called bisect, you give it a function, you give it a domain, and you give it a stopping tolerance, because at some stage you want to stop splitting. You, you, some accuracy is enough for you, so. So this is an overloaded operator. This means if zero is included in my uh, interval evaluation, and if my diameter, so that means I, I'm green. If the diameter is sufficiently small, then I just output it, then I've reached my tolerance. Otherwise, I split my interval in half and do the same thing again, two halves, and just repeat this. So it's just recursive. Okay. And this will do that for you. So it's a nice, clean way of coding. You don't have to worry about kind of starting the thing, finding different signs of the endpoints and it will output a cover of all solutions. But however, it's not guaranteeing any existence. I mean, it might give you a green box that doesn't contain a zero to the function. It could be that your function comes very close to being a zero, and at the tolerance you've set, you can't resolve that it's not a zero, really. So it's a false positive somehow. But it will never take away anything. So if, if your interval evaluation is well defined, that means if you don't divide by zero or something, then you'll get an enclosure of all zeros of f. So for any zero of f on your domain, that will be in one of these that you output. Okay. But you can't say for sure, okay, it outputted 10 subintervals, so there are 10 zeros. That's not true. Doing that, you need something more sophisticated. And now we're switching back to mathematics again. You need some kind of fixed point theorems. And the first one is Brouwer's fixed point theorem. So if you map a ball into itself with a continuous function, then you know that there is a fixed point theorem. So that will give you existence. I in a different setting, you might want to use Schauder's fixed point theorem. And if you want existence, you'll use Banach's fixed point theorem. Then you need contractions, you really need kind of C1 information, seeing that you're getting contracted. But then you get both existence and uniqueness. And I'll show you method, how we can incorporate these fixed point method theorems into numerical methods. So the kind of the nonlinear counterpart of Gaussian elimination is Newton's method, right? That's a workhorse for solving nonlinear equations. And it would be really nice if we could make a rigorous version of Newton's method. Because Newton's method, although it's great for solving nonlinear equations, it's terrible at the same time. That's how chaos theory was discovered, basically. Because you took some initial point, and it never converged to a zero of the function. It just went round and round and round and round. And this was kind of early stages of Julia sets and Mandelbrot uh, sets. I mean, this was complex dynamics. And it took a long time for people to understand why, why it happened. But, but we'll try to tame the Newton method and we'll make it set valued. And the natural way, or the, the good way, maybe not the natural way, but this, uh, this is a good way, is to define it as follows. So you, now we're assuming that we have a, a nice derivative to our function. The previous result was just topological. Well, let's say that f is c1. 
Then we can, of course, find the interval evaluation of its derivative. So I call that D capital F. That returns the range of F prime. I mean, an enclosure of the range of F prime. And this theorem or, works in higher dimensions as well. And this is going to be the matrix then of partial derivatives. Right? And then X will be a, a box, so a vector of intervals in this case. Now, if this was not interval valued, it would just be the normal Newton method. So here's your initial guess, and this is your corrector. And you do that by solving a system of linear equations. Now we have to solve a system of nonlinear uh, of interval linear equations to get this. But let's just go back to the scalar case, just for so I can illustrate what's happening here. So here's my Newton operator. So the only thing I made set valued is the differential here. Although, since I'm performing multiplication here and subtraction here, everything is going to be intervals, but these are going to be very, very thin intervals just to control the rounding error. So I'll do outward rounding on that and so forth. But then the following amazing statements, oh well, first is not amazing. <laughs> well, it just says that you're not losing anything. If, if your real value function has a zero in the domain that you're looking for, then you won't lose it. Then the Newton operator will also contain that zero. And of course, you assume that it was in x, but it's also going to be in nf of x. So of course, it's going to be in the intersection of them. Right? That's just a consistency statement. Here's an exclusion principle that says, if your domain x gets mapped outside itself of this Newton operator, if they have no empty intersection, then there actually is no zero in your domain. So that's a way to disprove the existence of zeros. But this is a nice part. If your domain gets mapped into itself by the Newton operator, then there is exactly one zero inside there. Then x contains a unique zero of f. And actually, this contains a unique zero of f. And this is going to be smaller than that, in that case. So there, now we have an existence theorem, because this is a continuous function that maps something that's homeomorphic to the ball. Well, in one dimension, a ball is just an interval. Maps it into itself. The existence comes from Brouwer, and the uniqueness comes from actually seeing that you can prove that this is a contraction then. So that's a way to count zeros. The bad thing about this is that we have this big matrix that we have to invert naively. We don't do this, of course, but in principle, you have to invert this and then multiply. There's a, a souped-up version of this called the Kraftjik operator. It's very similar, except that the only interval part comes here. So there's no inversion here. So this is like a Taylor expansion of this. <laughs> so you see, we're, here we have the normal Newton method, and then here we have the corrector term, which is kind of a preconditioner. Here is a point that preconditions that. So if your interval is small, and this is the radius of your interval, this is going to be small as well, this overestimation here. And this has the same properties. It's just, it looks harder to compute, but it's actually easier. It gives you better performance in general. And you don't have to invert any, you don't have to use any interval linear solvers for this, because it's just a matrix here. Or a vector, sorry. And the same statements hold that. You can exclude zeros, and you can prove existence and uniqueness. So that means I can give you a nonlinear function, and this will tell you that nonlinear function has exactly two zeros, for instance. I'll tell you where they are as well. Because under very mild conditions, uh, this guy is going to give you quadratic convergence, just like the real-valued Newton method. So at each iteration, the number of digits is going to double. That means that you're going to see this very rapid shrinkage of the interval enclosures. So they're really fast going to machine precision. So this is how you just set it up. You start with an initial region, and then you just compute these on and on. This is how you do it. 
And this is a geometric picture of that. So at stage i, I'm at this green set. That's my xi. And here's my real valued function that I don't have any information about except that I have a set valued extension of it. I take the midpoint, I go up, and then a normal Newton method would just follow the tangent line down, and that would give me a new point here, and then I would go there and follow that tangent line down, and hopefully I would converge, but there's no guarantee for that unless you check that the Kantorowicz conditions hold. What this does is that it takes a whole set valued slope, so any slope the red function has here over the green domain, I take here, so I get a cone down. I project with all possible slopes down that the function can have. So this blue interval is guaranteed to contain the intersection of my function and the x-axis, because it's all slopes it could possibly take on the way down. And in this case, I don't have, I can't exclude, and I can't prove anything. But I see that they have non-empty intersection, so I take their intersection, that's going to be my next xi plus 1, and then I redo the thing again, and eventually it's going to get mapped into itself, and then I'm going to zoom in on that point there. So this is what the interval Newton method does. And this will then guaranteed find you things. And you know what the Newton operator does, it takes unstable fixed points and makes them super stable. So even if you have repelling fixed points, it will zoom in on them, like like that, really fast. Okay. So, if, if well-defined, that means no division by zero or anything nasty like that. This is never worse than bisection, and it converges quadratically fast as soon as it's kind of got this mapped into case. So let's look at an uh, easy example here, just a polynomial with a kind of generic search domain. If you plug this into uh, this mm, kind of any implementation of what I just told you, it would look like this. So here's your initial domain, and you see here's the radius. So you see that it's kind of, you're not getting so much more in the beginning. It's a bit like just splitting in half. But as soon as it finds something, I guess here, you go from 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 12, and then it bottoms out at 10 to the minus 15, because that's about the distance you can get in floating points. I mean, that's the uh, machine epsilon. It doesn't have more accuracy than that. So then you have a, a convergence, and you know that at, at some stage it will to tell you that you're actually mapped into yourself, so it will give you a guarantee of existence as well. And it's a great stopping condition. Stop when you don't improve anymore, right? Because after a while, it will try to contract mathematically, it should go to zero, the radius. But since you're computing with floating points, there are rounding <laughs> errors taking place. So those rounding errors will kind of dominate completely. And that tells you when to stop. There's no way you can get higher precision than this, unless you switch to a multi-precision library. So that's a very natural stopping condition. And it gives you maximum precision then, in very short time. <coughs> if you have several zeros, then you have to do bisection first until your Newton operator is going to work. So you bisect basically on a very coarse level until you isolate the zeros and then you unleash Newton's method or Cantor or, or, or Kraftschick method on it. So here's another, I mean, easy nonlinear but nonlinear function. Um, just a given domain, a stopping tolerance. Here I've told it to stop. Don't compute more than 10 digits or 10 decimals of accuracy. You can do that as well. And it will start splitting, and then it will start applying Newton's method, and it will validate. So it will actually give you a list of all the zeros of the function. And this is a kind of nice interval notation. It means that the lower endpoint is given by these numbers, and the upper endpoint is given by these and then you go to that. So it's the uncertainty in the trailing decimals that it shows, basically. Because when you have many common, I mean, when you compute tight intervals, you don't want to repeat this twice in the upper and the lower bound. So. And this is kind of magic that you can do this. It's really powerful. And in many cases, you need to find zeros of nonlinear functions. Uh, and you need to find all of them. 
right? And this will do it in a kind of automatic way for you. So some applications of this uh, I've been doing with uh, Spigny of Gallias uh, in Krakow, where we compute periodic orbits for ordinary differential equations. Now that doesn't sound like finding zeros to nonlinear functions, because they have a flow. But if you introduce what's called a, a first return map, you get a function, a map, that takes a point and tells you when it first comes back. So that is a map, so that's our nonlinear f in this case. And of course, a fixed point of that map is going to be a periodic orbit, because it means that you flow and you come back to exactly where you started. That's a periodic orbit. And a fix, finding a fixed point of a function or finding a zero of a function is the same thing. But, well, it's not the same, but they're equivalent. So uh, you can easily, by just translating it, turn it into a zero finding problem. So that's what we do. So our nonlinear function f there is given by flowing, rigorously flowing differential, uh, the flow of a differential equation back to some plane. Okay. So then we can prove that they're orbits. And these orbits are unstable, so there's nothing, you would never find them in, a, in any numerical simulation because they kind of repel nearby orbits. But since we can introduce this Poincaré map or this first return map and then use Newton's method on it, this instability disappears, because that's what Newton does. It's a preconditioner. It takes any fixed point and turns it into a super attracting fixed point. That's what's so good about Newton's method. We also do this for, for computing. Um, this is a different project with Daniel Vilchak, also in Krakow, but a different university, uh, where we compute uh, stable regions, I mean, where you have non-chaotic behavior in the quadratic map. This is a the map that Robert May became, uh, and Feigenbaum became famous for looking at period doubling cascades. So again, these maps, for some parameters, they have stable periodic orbits, and for some parameters, they have chaotic dynamics. And we were kind of finding all the stable periodic orbits using these types of methods, root finding or zero finding methods. And again, that is going to be a highly nonlinear function because you're looking at high iterates of this. It's like a polynomial of a degree several thousand that you have to work with. But it works, and you can actually prove things about this. Now, extending the concept of finding zeros, one dimension, brings us to finding level sets of a function. So now we should not expect that the solution is an isolated point, but it could be a, a kind of a family of curves. So here's a classical, I mean, just a basic example. You have it now, we're in two variables, and we have one constraint. So that should give us some kind of one-dimensional solution set, generically. Right? So if you plug this into MATLAB, it has a built-in intrinsic that does this for you. And I forget the name of that intrinsic. But it's something with, in, oh, no, I should level set or something like that. So you just enter the function and the domain, and it will give you this picture. Right? And it looks okay. It looks a bit ragged up here if you check. And there might be some numerical artifacts. You're not sure really. So uh, I was pretty pleased with this. I have no idea how it made this picture. But then I said, okay, so let's try the following. Let's not find the level set of f equals zero. Let's find the level set of absolute value of f equals zero. That should be the same set of points, right? If f is 0, then surely the absolute value of f is 0. So I plugged that into MATLAB, and I got nothing. There were no points that satisfy that, which is very strange. Until you look into MATLAB's code and see how does it find these level sets. Well, what it does, it puts out loads of points, fills this, this domain with points, and then it traverses them like this, for each point, it evaluates the function, f, and then it checks for sign changes, right? Because that's where I'm going to be zero. And of course, if you have the absolute value of f, you're never going to have a sign change. It's going to be positive all the time, right? Therefore, it doesn't find anything. Now, we could take this divide and conquer method that I showed you earlier in MATLAB, exactly the same, just that x is now two-dimensional, and it will work. 
right? It will give you this, for different discretization levels, it will throw away portions that provably do not belong to this level set. And at the end, you'll get something. Again, you have no proof that the level set is there, but if it, wherever the level set is, it has to be enclosed in this reg region. Then, of course, you can prove that there actually is level sets there by using more sophisticated methods, but, but this is what it does. And, it, of course, you get exactly the same picture with the absolute value, because I'm not looking for sign changes. I'm just checking that my interval image contains zero. Okay. And here's a bonus problem uh, that I like to show uh, about quadrature. And now I'm giving MATLAB a hard time here. I actually like MATLAB a lot. I use it a lot, so I should say that. Here's a, here's a perfectly good integral. So no singularities, nothing. The domain is finite. Everything is good. It's daylight. It's all good. You could give this to any scientific computing 101. You shouldn't give it to your calculus students. I don't think it has a primitive function that you could find so easily. So let's resort to MATLAB. MATLAB has, uh, I mean, intrinsics for, for quadrature, called quad, of course. Uh, it has a very nice syntax. You just, it parses the function for you. So you just give the function and the domain from 0 to 8. And it outputs your result, like that. Very easy. I built a validated quadrature method, of, and I can kind of vary the order of my integration method as well. This one uses an adaptive Simpsons method, so it's fourth order, and it adaptively splits the domain until it meets some stopping condition. So if I do that, here's the domain 0 to 8. I use a fourth order, and I want this tolerance. So I want my integral enclosure to be of at most that width. Then I get this result. So it's, uh, I'm splitting in eight and a half thousand times my domain. It takes half a second. This takes about one second to compute on a quad core machine. Uh, and this is my result, my validated result. And that does not include that. So that made me be curious. So I, I changed now. So now I'm computing with 20, uh, 20 degree solver for my, for my integral. I'm um, using a much higher toler a lower tolerance. I'm getting all of these digits are guaranteed. So MATLAB gives completely wrong result and it issues no warning whatsoever. Yes? How come is it quicker? This is quicker because when I use when I use a 20 degree polynomial to approximate my integrand, I don't have to split as many times. So order is good, right? So you, you can choose, you can play around with, uh, with that, with your tolerance and with your, uh, the order of your approximants. So this uses Taylor series expansions and it uses kind of validated, ta so Taylor series with rigorous error bounds. So in the picture I showed you with the graph enclosure, I was using zero-degree Taylor orders, just boxes. First-degree Taylor order would enclose the graph with cones locally. And this encloses this with 20-degree Taylor polynomials. So yeah, so here you see, actually, you get better results faster. That's a good observation. I'm glad you asked. And they're rigorous. So you can just imagine how many of these kind of integrals are lying deep inside some code somewhere. You might not have programmed them yourself. If you have code generation that does this automatically for you, no warning at all issued. Your code is just going to produce rubbish after that, right? So there, there's a big, and these are not hard problems. I, I should explain why MATLAB fails here. This is a highly oscillatory integral because we have e to the x and e to the 8 is reasonably big, and that means that sinus is going to go up and down, and that means that the, the stopping condition here is when the integral doesn't get any more contribution, then you stop splitting. And this up and downness confuses MATLAB, so it, they kind of cancel out. So the plus parts and the minus parts look like zero. So it doesn't see any more contribution by splitting more. So then it thinks it has stabilized the result, and then it stops. 
that's why. There's nothing wrong with the, the quad method. Adaptive Simpson is good, but the stopping condition is not appropriate for oscillating integrals. Whereas my validated method doesn't care. I mean, it knows the error it's committing. It knows an upper bound on the error. So it will just keep on splitting until it reaches the tolerance I told it to. Or it will crash, or it will never kind of converge. That's the worst thing that can happen. But it will never stop and give me the wrong result. Okay. So this is an important point, I think. Uh, and it's not hard to write these validated things either. Now I want to extend the concept of finding zeros even more. So we went from finding zeros to finding level sets, and now the even more general, the most general, is kind of set inversion. And that is actually the framework for parameter estimation, which is usually applicable in all kind of areas here. So the f formulation is that you, you have some model, y is equal to f of x, then your model depends on a finite set of parameters. Could be infinite, but let's keep it finite now. Finite set of parameters. Now you're given some data, finitely many, n points, where you have pairs, x and y's, that should match this, and you have some parameter space that you're looking for. So the goal here is you're given your model, you're given your data, you want to find the parameters that make your model match the data as well as possible. That's parameter estimation. And I call this set inversion because what we're trying to find is the inverse of f with respect to p and the, over this set of data. So that's what it is. Okay. So for, this is a very hard problem, I, I should say. And f can be anything. It could be a function. It could be a process. It could be a PDE. And there's no way that will work for everything. It just, just won't work. So you, you have to have a little kind of handiwork on, on this. So existence and uniqueness are really problematic here because with noisy data, which you usually have, or an incorrect model, which you always have, I mean, <laughs> otherwise it wouldn't be a model. It would be the real system, right? Uh, there's usually no parameter that pr produces a perfect fit, of course. I mean, this we cannot expect. So th that means that our solution space, mathematically speaking, is empty. So then we want to find something that is close to that. Right? And uniqueness, even if we had unlimited amounts of exact data and our model was exactly right, there's no reason to expect why there should be one, I mean, or isolated solution. Just think of the level sets. I mean, the, the solution might look like a level set. Right? There could be a continuum of solutions. So just because you generated the data from some parameter, in some testing that you're doing, you usually do that. You build your model, plug in a parameter, generate data, and you want to get that parameter back. There's no reason in general why you should get that. And that's system identifiability, this is called, and that's a big issue. Right? And then instability. Usually these inverse problems are terrible. That means that the inverse of f with respect to p is kind of ill-conditioned somehow. So that makes it uh, sensitive. I mean, if you change your data a little bit, your optimal parameter is going to change a lot. Right? It's not always the case, but very much. So the way people solve this generally is statistical approach, so some least squared method. You guess some p, and then you compute what your model predicts, and you compare that to the data, you square it, and put some weights on it, and so on. So you want to find the p that optimizes, that minimizes this, right? And then um, you use, so it's optimization with uh, li least squared. Now, if the parameters enter your model linearly, then this is straightforward, I should say, because then it's linear algebra, basically. So that, then you can solve it quickly and, and reliably. If it's not, then this is hard. Right. Then this is global optimization. You're trying to find the p that minimizes this function. If p is nonlinear in f, yeah, you global optimization, and that, that's a tough problem. And also, the way you select these weights is very, I mean, <coughs> delicate. They, they should somehow con be like the inverse of, of the standard deviation of the data that you have there. So if you're uncertain at some point, 
you should weigh it more than or less than the other points. Well, that's a lot of heuristics, and if you change the weights, your solution moves a lot. So people just put weights to one usually, which is probably just as well if you don't know what you're doing. Okay, so we're not going to use this statistical approach. We're going to use a set-valued approach and try to kind of match our model with our data. So we're going to assume that there is no solution to begin with. Our data is wrong or it doesn't match up with the model. So we're going to widen both of them. We're going to make them set-valued. So it's a way to relax the problem. We may, we're going to fatten our data. We'll assume that this x, which is usually a time or something, that's known exactly, but it's this y part that's not so sure, right? So we're going to widen that, make it set-valued, and we're going to plug in whole chunks of parameters into our model at once. So we're not going to look at one parameter at a time, we're going to look at boxes of parameters, for instance, at a time. So this is what it's going to look like. Here's a kind of classical point-valued setting. We would have a, a kind of an exact model, and from that we would get exact model predictions. Here we have plugged in a whole interval of parameters, and so this is what our model prediction looks like. It doesn't look like points. It gives us intervals as our model prediction. Okay. And then we want to match that with our interval data. And the naive way to do this is to just bisect our parameter space into sub-boxes, finitely many, call them pj, and then we check them separately. So this is completely parallelizable, if you want. And you have three possibilities here, according to divide and conquer again. Either your model prediction, your set-valued model prediction, is going to map inside all your interval data. That's perfect for each of your data spots here. Then you save that. That's a good parameter. It, it corresponds to your data. Or it's going to be inconsistent with your data. That means that at at least one point, your model is going to be way outside your data. So it's a mismatch there. Then you can prove that there's no parameter inside that parameter domain that's ever going to fix this problem. Throw it away. Or you can't decide these. You have intersection, non-empty intersection, but not inclusion everywhere. Then you keep it and you subdivide it. Okay. So let's look at some basic example here. We have two parameters, P1 and P2, just so I can plot. Um, at some sample points. Here's my sharp parameter that I plugged in to generate data. And then I added noise to the data. So I added plus minus 90% to the data. And let's see what parameters are consistent with that. So here's what the, the function looks like for those parameters. It's this red graph. And these blue points would be the exact data. But I'm actually widening that. I'm uncertain about the data. And then I'm looking in parameter space. And you don't see it here, but I think my starting conditions was 0 to 200 in both parameters. So really large. So it immediately throws everything away. And what you get at the end is this set of red and green parameters. The green ones are those that are guaranteed to be good. So if I take this parameter slice, this box, plug it into my model, then I'll get a fat graph that is within these blue intervals, all of the blue intervals. So that is guaranteed to be good. The ones that you don't see, they're the ones I've discarded. They've gone completely outside one of these, at least one of these, so they're gone. And the red ones, that's the boundary where I'm working at. They're, that's my subdivision splitting. I can't decide. They're kind of straddling one of the endpoints of these, so I don't know, really. And you see that the original parameter that I generate my data from is exactly here. Okay? So this set is not centered on that parameter. And there's no reason it should be, because my function is nonlinear. My parameters enter nonlinearly. So if you're trying to do statistics on this, you would get that the midpoint would be here. So you would give that as your best guess. And then maybe if you're doing covariances, you would get some kind of ellipsoid regions here. But there's no way you can describe this with elementary statistics, this set. Plus that you would be kind of off as well. Now you can use this, why 90%? Let's take 10. Suppose that we had better control of our data, or 20. What you see now, just I've taken away the green boxes as well. You see how the, 
the, the parameter solution kind of converges to this sharp parameter, P. So this tells you how sensitive your parameters are with respect to noise in the data in a very nice way that is hard to capture by traditional statistical kind of estimators, right? This takes into account all the nonlinearities of your model function. And you can kind of think th of this as level sets of some hill. <coughs> so the probability is kind of highest that you hear, and then kind of for s bigger errors, it's least likely that you have big errors. So this will be kind of a discrete, kind of not Gaussian curve, but kind of some probability distribution. Okay. And now I just want to say how to speed things up, and then I'll stop. Okay, so this was divide and conquer, and that's fine in low dimensions. If you're trying to split things in 10 dimensions, it's not going to work. It's going to be too slow. So is there some way we can kind of throw away portions of parameter space without splitting? Yes, and this is called constraint propagation. So we use this to quickly discard inconsistent regions in the data and in the parameter space, both in the data and the parameters, without splitting. And this is kind of the magic part of set-valued numerics. So let's take a simpler function with just one parameter so I can show you the computations. And here's our parameter space, 0 to 1. And let's just give us one data point. So at the point 2, I know that my data is between 1 and 3. Okay, so I have an interval data there, sitting there. Now I want to say something. Well, by forward interval evaluation, I can just plug in my whole parameter domain in my function. And then this is just interval arithmetic with the exponential interval and so forth. What I get is this is my interval image. So this is guaranteed to contain the range of, of this, right? So this is what my model can produce over the whole parameter space. And you see the upper bound is 2. There's no way my model ever can produce the upper half of this data. So I can immediately throw away that upper half of data. Great, because I'm allowed to do that. I can contract my data over the whole if I plug in the whole search space here. So from 1 to 3, I go to 1 to 2, OK? So if I'm a bit kind of overcautious when I put intervals on my data, I can repair that. But the important thing is going the other way around. And to do that, we have to think about our model in the way a compiler or a program thinks about it, in a directed acyclic graph. So this is our model. It takes x and p as inputs, multiplies them, takes a minus of that, exponentiates that, and then multiplies that with x. Then we get our function. It was x to the e times e to the minus px. So this is how we would punch it in on a calculator, right? And what we're doing, well, here's another way to look at it, just a code list. This is really how the compiler writes it down when, you, when you're compiling this function. It does it in these kind of, in this way. Okay, and a forward sweep of this code, you plug in the parameter domain here, you plug in your x, and out comes a y. Okay. So this gives you constraints on y starting from x and p. Given x and p, you know what y has to be. Now the nice bit about this is we can go backwards. Let's just reverse this. We can go from y and x, for instance, and land in p. So we're going backwards in our directed acyclic graph to put restrictions on the parameter. Because now we know we have an upper bound for y, or we have an enclosure for y, we have an enclosure for x. And then we just go, we take the inverse of these operators that we had before. And that gives us, again, a code list. So before we ended up at n6, now we start with n6, and n1 gives us n5. This is the inverse of the l exponentials. We're getting the log. Ah, the inverse of negation is just negation. And then the inverse of multiplication is division. And if we plug our numbers into this, so let's see. Well, the forward sweep removed our, our data to 1, 2. Now if we do the backward sweep, we're ending up at the parameter p, which we've now constrained to this. 
you just plug in the numbers, everything is in interval arithmetic here, the logarithm as well, it's, everything is well defined. And we see that we're getting a contraction in parameter space. So we could remove 65% of the parameters by just propagating the information about x and y backwards in the DUG to P. We haven't split, we haven't done anything, we've just propagated the information forward and then backward. And this is constraint propagation. And it's perfect for set-valued mathematics because it gives us guaranteed kind of information all the time. So with one forward sweep, we reduce the data uncertainty by 50%. By one backward sweep, we remove the parameter space uncertainty by 65%. And then you can do this again. Because now the parameter is much smaller. You can sweep that forward again. That will give you another contraction in data space, and then backwards again, give you another contraction in parameter space, and so forth. Now this is such an easy example, so it's stabilized. If I go forward, I won't gain anything, and therefore I won't gain if I go backwards. So at some stage, you have to partition as well, if you want to go. You have to split. But then instead of splitting in parameter space, I can split wherever I want. So splitting in parameter space would be splitting here. But I might split here, or here, or here. Because each of these nodes now has an interval that contains the node range, right? And I can split anywhere inside my DUG and then propagate forwards and backwards from there. And it turns out the best way to split is at some point that has many connecting pieces. Because then the information propagates very quickly. But this is heuristics, I mean, where to split. When you have a big problem, your DAG is enormous. But you can do kind of lots of DAG arithmetic, basically. You can find sub-portions of your DAG that is where your function is monotone. You can find equal copies that you don't have to evaluate twice and so forth. Uh, one of my PhD students, Alexander Darnes, is building, has built actually a huge platform that does this. It takes a model, it takes the data, it constructs its DAG, propagates information in very clever ways backwards and forwards and splits when it has to in near optimal places. And that gives you this constraint propagation with the divide and conquer principle merged in one. So this works for very kind of hard parameter estimation problems. So I, I'll skip one, one kind of tricky application and just come to these conclusions that standard numerics does not produce mathematics a priori, it produces numerics. <laughs> That's why it's called numerics. Set-valued mathematics, however, enables us to revamp classical numerical methods to produce validated output. Okay. Existence and uniqueness come from fixed-point theorems that you have to incorporate into your algorithms. You have to see that something is mapped into something else, or that you have a contraction uh, on the right space. So this is very mathematical that you have to kind of bring down to your, your problem and your implementation. Set-valued methods are very suitable for inverse problems. I hope I've convinced you that root finding is an inverse problem, level set is an inverse problem, parameter estimation is an inverse problem. And this set-valuedness is great because you never lose any solutions and it gives you kind of rigorous control of what you're doing. The parameter estimation that we do, we do not use statistics, we use this relaxation by fattening the model and fattening the data. And, make it, and that's, in principle, is all you can ask for. Because you don't trust your model. Why should you look at a, a mathematically accurate model that you know is wrong? Look at one with a whole chunk of parameters and that will c maybe capture the true thing. Right? Uh, and the relaxed problem then is well posed and can be uh, solved by set inversion, this kind of constraint propagation techniques that I've told you about. So this, uh, these are the kind of take-homes. Then for just for information, there's this whole community of interval people. And they have a web page with conferences, literature, early literature, people working in the domain. Uh, this is the MATLAB package, Intlab, that used to be free. Now it costs some symbolic fee to use. It just plugs straight into MATLAB if you like that. And this will do rigorous uh, numerics for you. 
Here, if you prefer C++, there's a full library. It has optimization, multivariate, everything built into it, CXSC. Very easy to install. Here's my homepage. I don't know why I put that, but we do this. So if you're interested in that, you can check. And then as a last kind of really outrageous uh, commercial for myself, <laughs> there's a book on this, a very elementary book aimed at master level students, basically. So I wrote it so I could understand it myself. So that's the limit. Uh, uh, and it has lots of the examples that I showed you today, and not all, but it's... It's kind of, I think it's readable anyway. If you're interested in it, I've brought a copy today so you can have a look at it. Uh, and by that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Warwick. I can attest that if you like the talk, you will love the book. <laughs> Questions from the audience? No, I'm not using the, yeah. So the question was in, in the example with the level set that MATLAB was having problem with. Um, since I'm using the absolute value, the derivative is going to be troublesome. Yeah, but I'm not using any C1 properties for that. There I'm just using divide and conquer. And that's why I said that I couldn't prove that the level set looked like the output, but it was guaranteed to be enclosed in it. If you want to prove something about existence, then you need C1, so there you have to be careful about the derivative. Yes. Uh, I mean, if you want to use this uh, value in numerics for, say, really complicated models mm -hmm. uh, with lots of differential equations, yeah. I mean, can you say a few words about, I mean, how uh, yeah. Yeah. time consuming? Yeah, so if we want to use this for, for very big, complicated systems, yes. I mean, when it comes to ODE solving, it really depends on the problem, uh, I can say. I can, I can easily solve a 10,000 dimensional system but I can also stumble on a one-dimensional system. And this is true for non-rigorous numerics as well. I can break any non-rigorous optimization program with a one-dimensional problem. That's no, not difficult at all. But in general, I mean, if we discard the kind of extreme things, of course, if you're trying to solve differential equations in high dimensions using rigorous techniques, and if they're not trivial in the sense that the solutions tend to a stable equilibria or something like that. If you have, for instance, a chaotic system where, where the solutions just wander around forever, then it's not going to work for a long time or for a large system. You're going to see wrapping effects that I haven't talked about today, and overestimation is going to harm you. On the other hand, what you're going to see with non-rigorous numerics is just rubbish. It's going to look good, but it has nothing to do with the underlying system. So you'll f you can simulate the Lorentz equations, for instance, which three-dimensional OD, absolutely fine, it's chaotic, and you can simulate that forever using a non-rigorous solver. But after about time 10, everything it produces is just going to be random, I mean, effects from that. So in some sense, the fact that you're having problems with these validated methods is good because it reminds you that your system is very complicated, if it is. So that's a reminder that, uh, okay, so something is happening here and I have to increase, increase the precision or I can't make any firm assertion about what's happening here. So it's a kind of good reminder sometimes that people f seem to forget because it's so easy to just compute and compute and compute and you never notice when things are... are rubbish after a while. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, maybe uh, I was thinking about these uh, squares and rectangles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course it's kind of intuitive because uh, you think about the domains in the, in, in the uh, argument and the function. And, uh, uh, but, but could you maybe 
make some kind of improvement by some other kind of geometrical objects? Yes, yes. So you're asking so you're also, about why, why we have these axis parallel domains all the time. Uh, that's just for simplicity and of course you should think of other domains. For instance, when I do root finding in the complex domain, I use circular arithmetic because it's much more natural. For mathematicians, we never work with, I mean, in the soup norm, it makes sense, but uh, otherwise you, you work with balls, of course. But there, there are also other people that work with sonotopes, which are, I mean, very complicated uh, volumes, basically. Then the arith arithmetic becomes horrendous, but sometimes that pays off. So you can choose, you, so this is the simplest geometry somehow to work with. So it's very easy to implement. The circular arithmetic is not hard at all, and there are there's complex libraries for this. So you're absolutely right. You should choose your, your domains uh, appropriate for your, for your um, problem. And, and in general, I mean, when we work with uh, infinite dimensional spaces, we work with functions, I mean, set-valued function domains, which are appropriate for that problem. Yeah. Talking with Melvin in the early 80s about the IEEE floating point stand. And I was wondering, of course, I guess all your follow up introduction of that standard, but it seems to me if you didn't have that standard, the things you're doing would be very, very difficult to do. Is that, is that correct? Uh, so you're, my work on rigorous numerics depends a lot on the IEEE standard. That's because, it, because it gives you some primitive operations it, that have nice mathematical properties. And before that, yeah, right, but it. But I would say it doesn't matter so much because we had to reinvent everything for all the functions, trigonometric standard functions, mm -hmm. and we could certainly do that for arithmetic as well. It wouldn't have been so, so bad actually. In fact, there is an IEEE uh, group working out uh, IEEE standard for interval arithmetic at the moment. Uh, and uh, uh, I shouldn't say this online, but unfortunately we're having the same type of arguments, uh, very lengthy arguments as the uh, original IEEE floating point committee seem to have. Uh, there are lots of, I've just shown you one version of, of interval arithmetic, there are others. I mentioned that you can divide by zero. This is very important for some people and not so important for other, or even dangerous for other applications. So there, there's some controversy about what should be the standard. But I think this will, once it's done, it will help computer manufacturers to actually put it on hardware. And that would be really nice to have in tools on hardware. That could kind of allow you to switch from just computing with the midpoint, that would be non-rigorous, or adding the bounds as well, rigorous. So. I guess I'm a little surprised because I mean, my impression, although I didn't look at my floating point standards much before I triple E, I don't think they generally provided the notion of rounding up, rounding down, and so on. They sort of did something. Hmm. The, the, the rounding round. modes are mentioned in the IEEE floating point right, but standard. standard but yeah. In terms of the, you know, before the standard, so you have oh, no, no. its yeah. Yeah. IBM, IBM had their arithmetic yeah. and so on. And yeah. I'm not even sure that they, they had a notion of rounding up mode and rounding right. down. I don't think they did. No, sort of no. Did yeah. And I think it, it, it was very fortunate that they included that for us. In, in, otherwise, it would have been hard to do things. But it's, it's still a problem. Every time you switch rounding mode on a CPU, you kind of smash the pipeline. So performance-wise, this is very, very bad. What is nice is on the modern GPU architectures, you get arithmetic operation fused with a, a specific rounding. That's a single operation in hardware. So there's no penalty at all for using different rounding modes. So that gives us really fast interval libraries on the GPU, something that we're developing in my group right now, actually. I don't recall in the IEEE standard, do they specify that you have these operations to set rounding modes? And you have to be able to do that. But is the GPU formulation cons completely consistent with the standard? Maybe the standard prematurely. The standard was premature. Yeah, the standard, did the standard uh, say how to implement these rounding? No, not at all. And actually, MATLAB has it, but it's hidden, it's undocumented but we know how to do it, <laughs> but they don't want to support it, <laughs> but we know how to do it. On every, it, 
every compiler has a different way of doing it. Every library has a, it's a nightmare if you're trying to build an interval package that will compile on several architectures. Oh, sorry, yeah. So, sorry. Yeah. So, following up, are you, are, are you engaged in any discussions with like, like you, the uh, processor architects at Intel and so on about, you know, why don't you move a little bit in this direction? It would open up windows in terms of what could be done. I'm talking to some people, but I can't tell you which. Okay. But this is a yes about around it, yes. But there is a dialogue. Yes. Um, tea and coffee uh, and cake outside. So on this note, uh, I would like to thank you again one more time very much. And we have a tradition here of a small gift for our speaker, so <laughs> thank you so much, Warren. Thank you. This was really great. Thank you.